and today's topic is all about eye health and cataract surgery and joining me today to talk about this is Dr. Christopher Shelby. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, it's good to be here. Absolutely. You are the eye expert and we were talking a little bit in our midday newscast about cataract surgery and so you, you know, perform many of these surgeries every week. So tell we me do. a little bit about it. So you, the cataract, like we were talking about before, is simply a color change of your God-given lens. And what's important to know, and, and patients ask us this all the time, so are you polishing the lens? What is the cataract? Are you just taking that out? Mm -hmm. So cataract means waterfall. So if you Google cataract one of the, and you do images, you'll get some images of a waterfall. Because back in the day, the Greeks, as, the <coughs> as a cataract develops, it goes from clear to yellow to brown. And like looking at you right now, I see your pupil and it's black, okay, it's supposed to be. Well, if you had a cataract that was brown, it would still look black because we're getting a light reflex. Ultimately, the lens turns white. Mm -hmm. You know, you've probably seen a picture of an older person in mm -hmm. India, you know, like a National Geographic or a dog will have this white spot in the center of their pupil. You know, so they'll have the colored part of the eye and then it'll be white. That is actually, your lens has turned white. The cataract is so advanced. So back in the day, the Greeks would say, oh my God, it looks like a waterfall. Yeah. You know, and that means cataract, or cataract means waterfall. And so that name just stuck with it. So when we say you have a cataract, it means your lens has changed color. So lens and cataract are, are interchangeable. So when we're taking the cataract out, we're actually removing the lens. And the nice thing is, is the cataract surgery nowadays is very nice and gentle. Um, it takes six to 10 minutes, does not take long at all. But you know, like my dad used to say, it's all minor surgery unless it's on him, then it's all major surgery. You know, so it's easy to say, hey, it's, there's nothing to it. But we start an IV, we give a little sedation, the eyes dilated, we numb it up really good, obviously. Mm -hmm. We use an ultrasound to gently remove the cataract, which is your God-given lens. That ultrasound goes through a tiny incision, it's 2.4 millimeters, which is very small. And we make the incision where the colored part meets the white part of the eye. The cataract, once it's out, we clean everything up really good, and then we slip a new lens inside the eye. We do that all through that little bitty incision. There's no stitches. Like I said, it takes mm -hmm. six to 10 minutes. Most everybody notices an improvement in their vision that day. Wow. It is an interestingly painless procedure, you know, because when we're doing eye surgery, you can't just close your eyes and imagine you're somewhere else. You're front and present. The nice thing about the sedation that we use is what we call conscious sedation. Most patients don't remember anything, but they're responsive. So we can say, hey, Ms. Smith, look left, look right, look up, look down, but most patients don't move at all. Gotcha. You know? Yeah, and cataract surgery is one of the most common procedures, as, we, as you mentioned earlier. And so that makes it you know, a lot more safe and probably effective since you prob there's so many that are performed and so many people that actually need this. It is, it's, it's incredibly safe. It's probably one of the most, the, the safest, most effective procedures performed on earth. You know, and, and Dr. Coleman and I have a, a ton of experience and we've got a lot of wonderful technology and all the technology that we have is to improve the safety profile and to improve our predicted outcomes. Mm -hmm. Because back in the day, it used to be cataract surgery was you got a cataract, they waited until it was ripe, which I never knew what that meant. But what they were doing is they were waiting for it to be so dense that patients effectively were going blind. Because the old way to do it was to make an incision that if you can imagine looking at the eye like a clock, the incision went from 12 o'clock to six o'clock the entire lens was removed in bulk because hmm. the lens is pretty big compared to the incisions. And then there were a lot of stitches put in and there were actually, there wasn't a lens placed in. Patients were in the hospital for two to three days with sandbags wow. on the side of their head so they couldn't move back and forth because the complication rate was so high. Mm -hmm. you know, and then once the cataract surgery was done, you were left without a lens. So you were incredibly blurry and then patients got what we call aphakic spectacles, which were these Coke bottle thick glasses. Now, of course they could see with them, but mm -hmm. they had to have those glasses to see. Matter of fact, there's a picture of my great grandfather that he has aphakic spectacles on, you know, so his eyes, are, they, he's <laughs> got these bug eyes and you know, it's a classic picture from the 1920s where mm -hmm. you know, they're standing straight up, um, but it's very interesting. Yeah. And so the evolution of cater cataract surgery has actually been more of a revolution. You know, we, they went from uh, an intracap to an extra cap, which is a slightly smaller incision, but half the lens was removed. 
no lens was placed in, it wasn't very predictable to where now we do it through a tiny incision. We use a laser for a lot of the parts of the procedure. The lens technology is amazing. So we can get patients back to 2020. We get a lot of patients seeing better than they've ever seen without glasses. And that's even using just the standard normal lens that Medicare and insurance will pay for. That's incredible, mm -hmm. the change. So since you've been in practice, what have you seen from when you started to where you're at now? The changes. So, so the changes, like I said, the, the incision size has gotten smaller and smaller. You know, mm -hmm. we used to do what's called a retro bulbar block where we would inject medicine behind the eye to numb it up really good. Uh, because when I trained, they required us to do some intracaps and they required us to do extra caps, which were the bigger incisions because the technology hadn't quite made it yet. Uh, now we're using the tiny incisions and the digital overlay, like we use a microscope when we do surgery because it's very mm -hmm. small and fine. And now we use, still use a microscope, but we use 3D glasses. So we're doing surgery on a 55 inch screen mm -hmm. and it, it gives us amazing detail. And part of what we can do there is we can put overlays to verify lens power, lens position, we treat glaucoma at the time of cataract surgery, and so we can see those fine little bitty structures in the eye, to, which is the drain. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we can open those up, we can put stents in to help the, the, the pressure be lower after cataract surgery. It's really, uh, it's really been amazing. And you know, of course, I've been in practice long enough to where I can say, yeah, I saw these progressions. Yeah. Like with macro generation, like we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, uh, we used to do PDT, which is photodynamic therapy, where when a patient had macro generation, we would start an IV, give them a little dye in their veins and literally have a clock. And after a certain amount of time, we would shine a light onto the retina because it would stimulate that dye to produce these uh, free radicals, which we were hoping would cause the blood vessel growth back there that causes wet macro generation to damage those blood vessels to where they would regress. Mm. And then patients would have to put towels over their head because the sunlight would actually affect it on their skin. Right. You know? And then we also would go in and remove those little net networks of blood vessels. And now, you know, of course, the, you've heard of Avastin injections and things like that. The treatments for macro generation have been revolutionized also. Yeah, so kind of explain what exactly is macular degeneration? How does it come about? And you mentioned wet macular degeneration versus, you know, the there, other types. Yeah. Right, there's, there's wet and there's dry. Okay. <clears throat> and so macular degeneration, the technical term, is age-related macular degeneration. As we get older, there's wear and tear on all the body parts. When in, you, you have to have a little anatomy lesson first. So, mm -hmm. you know, the eye is a camera. Mm -hmm. Right, and so what it's doing is it's focusing light from out there as a sharp point onto your retina. The front part of the eye, which is the lens and the cornea, that's the part that we work on, is like the lens of a camera. You know, so we're changing out that lens, getting the image better. The retina is like the film of a camera or a CCD chip. You know, whatever's yeah. getting that image to be able to process it to where you can see it. Right. So the retina is the film, the macula is the center of your vision, okay? It is an anatomical structure in the retina that has a little depression in it called the fovea. And so light is shined right onto the macula and that's what gives you detail, mm -hmm. all right? That's where uh, most of the cones are, are packed in to where you can see fine detail when you're reading and you focus on the word the, okay? Mm -hmm. The is being projected onto your macula. Mm -hmm. The macula is very, metabolically demanding, okay, because there's a lot of oxygen requirements, a lot of turnover, so it has a lot of blood flow that goes back there. Over time, you can get little deposits called drusen in the macula, and it begins to thin out, and those little layers, blood vessels can actually break through. And so when we begin to see the drusen deposits in the macula, we call that macular generation. Gotcha. And what's interesting is, is that patients who have some early macular generation going from light to dark or dark to light, they will see these, you know, almost like splotchy things, you know, in their vision, in the mm -hmm. center of their vision. They'll describe like the part of their hand, they don't see it. Now when mm -hmm. the lights come on and things get brighter, okay, they're back to normal. And it's the function of going from rods to cones and cones back to rods, and they have some issues with that. And a lot of that has to do with the pigment layers in the retina itself. 
And so that's generally no big deal. You know, mm -hmm. we see those as people get older. And when we see the dry form of macular degeneration, we just let patients aware, hey, you've got this early macular degeneration. That's where the vitamins come into play. Yeah. You know, you've heard of Preservision, the AREDS mm -hmm. formula, those are very important. I actually take that on a daily basis because I'm pretty sure those antioxidants help prevent macular degeneration in general. The wet macular degeneration, which is, that's the buzzword that everybody worries they're gonna get and yeah. go blind. The wet form is when blood vessels come through those layers and begin to leak or bleed. Mm. And so what happens is patients are sitting there and then suddenly they have a sudden dramatic decrease in the center of their vision. And that's because they suddenly have a bleed that we call neovascularization. And that's when patients come in, we see that bleeding and then the retina specialist will do injections. And those injections are specifically designed, it was actually Avastin was created for colon cancer because mm -hmm. it makes blood vessels regress. So those injections cause a regression of the blood vessels, the blood can clear up and their vision can get back to somewhat normal. Wow, this is all very interesting. We're gonna put a pin in that. We've got yeah. Jim on the line. Thanks for joining us and what's your question? Yes, uh, thank you for your program. Uh, I've um, been doing a little research or study and uh, getting to, to that point where I'm going to be needing that probably in a year or two. Uh, I want to get your thoughts about uh, the cataract or something that I found um, uh, from some patients being interviewed uh, on, on the internet. I'm studying this and um, some past patients, and this was not local. This is you know in the United States of these particular patients where they stated that uh, he, uh, he went to a one doctor you know, maybe that they went to, really did the type of lens or surgery where it was uh, sort of like as a general, you fall in this category, this category, or this category, like a bell curve as, as opposed to specifically measuring your eye and getting the right type of uh, surgery and with the right lens and the right placement of it and, and then the other thing topic that they spoke of is uh, I think what y'all what's called you know, straight I'm not a physician but where you get the second cataract mm -hmm. surgery or the secondary one and it seems like there's some people that recommend against that there's something you can do at the beginning of the surgery to kind of clean up that rear lens but if you lose that at a later surgery there's nothing to adhere, or if you ever had to go back in, there's nothing to adhere the implant. Could you speak to those two things, please? Sure. So w with the first question, you're talking about the different types of lenses? Well, it's more, really more the physician. Uh, and I'm wondering how you handle this. Uh, the first physician that this particular patient went to really did more of a bell curve type of analysis of, of his measurements. He could tell he was in and out real quick and, okay. and they measured his eye in just like five minutes, whereas this other one, he could tell the way he was measuring it. He did more specific measurements of his eye and, and he got better results. I got you, okay, oh yeah, so. Um, and, and I used the bell curve, like he fell in a bell curve, okay, well you're this type of patient and I'm just gonna use this lens. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. So, you know, what happens is when you come in, let's say you came in today and we say, hey, you got cataracts. We can't get your vision any better, so we're gonna set you up for cataract surgery. We take a number of in-depth measurements because it used to be we'd measure the length of the eye. Here's where the lens is gonna go. We pick a lens power, we put it in, and, and we're pretty accurate. You know, we know you're gonna be, you're gonna see pretty well. You know, try to leave you a little bit nearsighted or whatever. Well, now the good news about having cataract surgery nowadays is you have a ton of options. And that's also the bad news. You've got a ton of options. And what that means is, is that when we take your cataract out and we put a new lens in, we can make it to where you've got great distance vision. You know, we can correct nearsightedness, we can correct astigmatism, things like that, to where your distance vision is as good as possible. We have lenses that are multifocal. They allow distance, intermediate, and near vision. We have lenses that we can adjust afterwards. That's the light adjustable to where we can modify the correction with some light based on what your demands are. And so that's easy to do. Those measurements are actually very easy. Now, not every patient out there is a candidate for the multifocal lens based on some information that we can gather from the cornea. 
So if you've had RK in the past or if you've had LASIK in the past, you may not be a perfect candidate for the, the multifocal lens based on some of the data that we get. And so we can look it through. And then what patients tell us, what we ask you, is how do you want to see when we're done? Do you, do you mind wearing readers? Do you want to just wear glasses for distance but be able to see well up close? Do you not want to wear glasses at all? And so based on that information, then we can look at that, those data sets and tell you what the best option is for you. And so that's one of the things that we do uh, in, in our practice is, is that we're very conscious of uh, the cornea, the placement of the lens, things like that. Because with the multifocal lens, with the light adjustable lens, with the toric lens, of course, that costs more money out of pocket because Medicare and insurance does not pay that extra fee for the lens. But the reality is, is that when you're paying for a lens, you're actually paying for a result. And what we try to do is improve our predicted outcome so we get to those results. Some guys out there don't do a whole lot of multifocal lenses because what they're afraid of is that if they don't have the perfect result, patients are going to be mad and then they have to exchange the lens. Now, the, that, and that leads into the second question about the secondary cataract. Uh, a secondary cataract is actually a misnomer. It's not a cataract at all. The lens, once we put it in and it's healed in, it's there. The bag, the capsule or bag that we put the lens in, where your old lens used to sit, effectively is a living structure. There's cells that live at the equator of that bag that we try to remove and polish as best we can. 50% of the time, that bag gets hazy because those cells begin to migrate a little bit. And so it causes a little fibrosis or scar tissue on the bag itself. And so when that happens, the vision decreases. We call that a secondary cataract. How we treat that is with a YAG laser where we dilate a patient and we use a laser to remove the central portion of that haziness. And that's the part that you were looking at where a patient said, oh, you know, or online said, well, you can't do that because if you make a hole in the posterior capsule, then you cannot exchange a lens. That is not true at all. And now, not a lot of people out there like to exchange lenses in bags that have been opened, but we do that. And we don't, we don't like to. We would much prefer to get patients seeing as well as possible. But for a number of different reasons, the lens can fail or not work well or slip, something like that, to where we can exchange the lens. And so, um, you know, that's the good and the bad about Google is, you know, you'll find a lot of different information. And, you know, what you need to do is talk to whatever surgeon uh, you decide to go to about those, those things. The vast majority of the time when we do cataract surgery, patients do very, very well. Those that have a little nearsightedness or farsightedness or astigmatism after cataract surgery, then we just deal with that with LASIK or PRK. There's a number of ways to get patients seeing very well without having to do lens exchanges. And just to kind of in closing, when you use the term that you try to polish it up, because these gentlemen or these patients spoke to that, there's something you can do at the time the original surgery to uh, make it where you don't have that second cataract or lessen the chances to mm -hmm. it, let's put it that way. Do you all do that? Of your, course. Your office? Mm -hmm. We do. And what does that entail? You're actually cleaning up that rear lens? Or so when, when at the time of cataract surgery, what we try to do is polish the capsular bag. So we remove as, as much of that epithelium as we can. And, and actually the lenses are now designed to where they have a, a right angle to the very back part of them, to where when the bag heals in, those cells won't try to, to grow up underneath them. Um, but the polishing they're talking about is that YAG laser. And that's what we do in the office where it, we just dilate the eye and we use that laser to remove those, uh, that little haze if it develops. But we try to help prevent that from happening. Okay, thank you, sir. All right. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Jim, for joining us, and thanks for your questions. If you're just joining us, you can give us a call at 318-219-4569. We're talking about eye health and lots about cataract surgery and cataracts and all that. And we have another caller on the line. Kenneth, thanks for joining us. What's your question? Hi, this is Kenneth Small. And I've had surgery before, and it worked fine. 
But a little while later, I, I started losing, you know, the sight. And I got right back where I was before. And I talked to some other people that had it, said they had the same problem. But I didn't know what to do after that. Do you go back and have surgery again or what? So you, you had cataract surgery? Yeah. And like right afterwards, it was great. The vision was wonderful. Yeah, I was seeing great. Yeah. And then how, how long a little did it, bit later. Yeah, how, how long did it take for your vision to feel like it got back to where it was before? Uh, it was about a, a couple of weeks. Okay. So uh, there, there's a couple of things. How long ago was your surgery, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, it's been over a year. Okay. So I, I didn't know what I needed to go. I thought it just wasn't doing no good for the people that were telling me. No, that that's so. Cataract surgery is wonderful. You know, of course, I'm I'm a little bit biased, but uh, the, what you're describing is not all that uncommon. And what I believe to be the case is, you know, number one, you've got this cataract that's been growing for quite a while. You have the surgery, uh -huh. and immediately it's like, oh my God, you know, things are brighter, more colorful, they're sharper. You know, you're seeing a whole lot better. And then over the course yeah. of a few weeks or a few months, a lot of patients will feel like eh, it's not quite as good as it was before. You know, right afterwards. And so a couple things happen. That's right. Yeah, a, a couple things happen is that if you imagine your, your God-given lens, the one we take out is about five millimeters thick. That is not very big at all. And so, but it's sitting in this bag. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we open that bag, we remove that cataract, and we put a new lens in the eye that's clear. That lens is half a millimeter thick. So it's one-tenth the thickness of your God-given lens. So immediately after surgery, mm -hmm. you know, the lens is clear, the bag is clear because there's some tension on it and you see very well. As that lens heals in, you have to imagine that bag begins to collapse behind it. And most of the time it smooths out like ironing a t-shirt, okay? Sometimes because of the redundancy of that bag behind that lens, you'll get little folds, little ridges in there and so it's like, oh, wow, the vision, it seems like it's getting worse. You're getting a little scatter, you know, kind of like the symptoms of the cataract. And so it feels like, oh, well, this wasn't successful. Uh, when that happens, we just need to take a look, you know, because a lot of times, kind of like I was telling the gentleman before, uh, a YAG laser solves that over 90% of the time. And as that lens heals in and shifts position a little bit and that bag gets a little bit redundant, it is not uncommon to feel like the vision was really good right afterwards, but now it's not quite as good. That's the most common thing that we see. And so what you're experiencing is not unusual at all. Uh, definitely go back to whoever did it and talk to them about it. Uh, you can come see us, we'll take a look. And because when your vision's not as good as it has been before, there's a reason why, and we can generally find it. Okay. I, one more thing. Uh -huh. Now, where I had it done, I've been going back, and they haven't said anything about it. They, you know, they see my vision wasn't different. Maybe I need to change doctors because they act like nothing's wrong. Yeah. Well, and, and listen, a second opinion is never a bad thing especially, and, and we recommend that a lot of times for our patients, because, you know, being able to look at you objectively without having any prior knowledge, you know, we know that you had cataract surgery, the, uh, your vision's now not as good as it used to be. We need to take a, we can take a look at things to see, you know, why it is that your vision's not quite as clear as it used to be. What is it that's causing that blurred vision, you know? So getting a second opinion, uh, th that's a good idea, especially if you feel like you're just kind of spinning your wheels. You know, you feel yeah. like you're not doing oh. as well, but you're being told, hey, you're doing great. You know, and it, it, those two things don't jive. Is it possible for me to see you all? Sure, absolutely. Matter of fact, you can, uh, you can call the, the clinic right now, 212-3937. Uh, tell them you, you spoke with me on, on Healthline, and we'll get you in real quickly and take a look. And not to do anything, just to take a look and give you our opinion on what's going on. Okay, that's two one two three nine two seven. Three nine three seven. 
one more time, please. Let's sure, write it down. sure, Kenneth. 212-3937. I got you. All right. Man, I appreciate your help. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we'd love to see you, and, and we'll see what's going on, and, and we'll go from there. All right. You have a beautiful day. All right. You too, sir. Thank you, Kenneth, for tuning in and for your question. So we have just a couple minutes left, and I want to kind of jump back into our macular degeneration talk. And you mentioned um, – uh, vitamins that you can mm -hmm. take for maybe preserving your vision. Yep. If you want to talk a little bit more about that, I think that's interesting. Sure. There, yeah, th there was a huge study done, uh, the ARED study, and what, what they found was that, that high doses of certain antioxidants help prevent the progression of macro generation. So patients who had the dry form, it really helped slow the progression or prevent the progression uh, into the wet form. And it's it simply vitamin E, vitamin C, copper, zinc, xanthine, and lutein. They used to have beta carotene in it, but there were some questions about beta carotene and lung cancer. And so, but they're readily available. There's a bunch of different uh, brands, but it's all like Macular Protect, PreserVision, things like that. Uh, and I recommend all my patients over the age of 50 to get, uh, get on some form of that. Yeah, my dad actually is on PreserVision. So my grandfather has macular degeneration. Is this something that is hereditary? It can be, you know, the 23andMe or one of those has this genetics test where it's like, are you at risk of macular degeneration, which I think is, I, I think it's a little bit irresponsible because people are like, oh my God, I'm going to have macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. It's like, eh, I mean, not necessarily, you know, not necessarily. Um, there are some genetic forms of it. There's a, genetic forms of, of a lot of things. Um, but generally it's one of those things where that's one of the reasons we like to see patients on a yearly basis is checking for those things because getting to it sooner rather than later is always beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is lifestyle has a lot to do with it, okay? Um, smoking, obviously, that's one of the worst things that we'll see with macro generation. Mm -hmm. We can almost guarantee you, you're going to get it if you're a smoker. And okay. so uh, diet, nutritional stuff, I believe, has a lot to do with it. You know, seed oils, um, processed foods, things like that can um, put people at a higher risk of macro generation. As it know. does with many things. <laughs> As it, yeah, it really does that we're now finding out, you know, yeah, right. and uh, sedentary lifestyle, things like mm -hmm. that. So. so it's funny that, well, lifestyle, my, so my grandfather was also a welder for mm -hmm. much of his life, so I don't know if that had anything to do with it, with your eyes being under maybe that stress. Probably could be, and the intense UV radiation, mm -hmm. you know, cause especially old school welders. I mean, I've seen these oh, guys, yes. you know, they're just, they'll grab it and I'm like, where's your hood, you know? And uh, they just do it and they get really good at it. And so probably does have some to do with it. Yeah, well, very interesting stuff. So I know that WKI Institute, you guys have a new location that's coming. We right? actually have, so the, our South Clinic, Okay. Uh, has just been remodeled. Remodeled. So okay, moved, that's yeah, right. And it's, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. Uh, and it's great for those patients coming from that area of town, uh, from Stonewall, those mm -hmm. areas. Uh, yeah, it's really, really beautiful. We're so getting a new uh, associate who's actually Dr. Coleman's sister. You know, nepotism is a good thing. <laughs> uh, but she is finishing up her fellowship right now, cool. and she'll be joining us probably, I believe, December uh, or January. Very exciting. So is this the remodeling? Is this adding anything, any more patient rooms or any? It is to the clinic. It is adding some patient rooms and we are also remodeling our operating rooms gotcha. right now. So um, it'll be, the flow will be nice. We'll, we're going to add a, a fourth operating room um, and we're looking forward to that too. That's exciting. Yeah. So real quick, you just gave us your phone number, but give it to us again. And where can we find you? So uh, we, we have uh, three locations, Wilson Knight and South, North, and my main office is at Piermont over at Portico. 212-3937 is my number. TheCataractSurgeons.com. You can go to and find all of our information there too. All right. Well, always a pleasure. You're yeah. always a wealth of knowledge. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Shelby. And if you missed this conversation, you can just head to our website at ktbs.com slash healthline3 and you can rewatch that. And if not, then we hope that you have a blessed and happy Friday.